The sermon for the 20th week after Pentecost is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, verses 12 to 19. Uh, the sermon is entitled, Jesus is Your Confidence. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Confidence. So important this is for everyone in some way, shape, or form. But since uh, Peter's here, um, I have to give this analogy. It's for you. But, the, for, but for those who ever played golf, you very well know how confidence plays a significant role in how you perform. And I apologize if you've never played golf. Uh, but if you haven't, uh, this might not really get to you as much as for Pete. But you prepare yourself in practice, right? Gaining that confidence, the driving range, the putting green, iron driver wedge, repetition after repetition, all in hopes of gaining that muscle memory, right? Because there, if we try hard enough, surely we will have the confidence. And finally, after much preparation that golf takes, it takes a lot, you set up on that tee, you're ready, you know, I got this, right? You go through your progressions, you swing, and what happens? You slice it or hook it right into the water. From that very moment on, all your confidence, it just disappears. Your confidence is visibly shaken. You shake your head, and there, when you get to the second tee, Oh no, what do I do now? With great apprehension, your muscles tense up, and all the repetition, all that practice goes out the window as you go with a trembling breath, second guessing everything that you have done, and there you are. What am I going to do next with this shattered confidence? Because in that very moment, there is that potpourri of many things that are going on in your mind. Panic, doubt, wonder, hesitancy, regret, worry, fear, and terror. And it's a buffet of disaster, if you tell me, as you try to navigate through this course or as we see it in this life. And so it was for the Jewish Christians in the book of Hebrews, as a writer exhorts them, saying, Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you with an unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. For if we share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end, that this original confidence is Christ's to the end. In the book of Hebrews, we very well know the audience are the Jewish Christians who held greatly to the Old Testament books of Moses. And to the end, as we know the Old Testament story, the Lord promised the Israelites deliverance to the promised land. Yet in the Exodus, they were faced with a body of water, as we know, fresh out the deliverance from the Passover lamb. They were ready to go, confident in the Lord and His promise. Yet as they were going, as they met this body of water, what happened? Pharaoh changed his mind and said, what? I need these people. So he sent out the chariots. He sent out the armies. And the Israelites saw the body of water on one hand. But on the other, they saw the chasing army and the chariots after them. And soon enough, they were trapped. Their confidence fell through the floor as this potpourri of fear, panic, disbelief, second-guessing, and regret was in their hearts and minds, and their confidence in the Lord had left, had left them in that very moment. And of course, by the grace of God, what does He do? Through Moses, he splits the Red Sea and again shows them his power, his grace, that his promise is true and their confidence is in the Lord only. Of 
Of course, joyous they went. Of course, God delivers because he is our Lord. With confidence at an all-time high, there it would reach an all-time low as their bellies started to grumble. And soon enough, they fell to disbelief. Their confidence soon clamored for their former lives as slaves, sitting by meat pots fed to the full. How much of a blessing it was for them to revert back to, once, to what they once had. The confidence in the Lord again was lost. And lastly, at Kadesh Barnea, where spies surveyed the land, the land to which the Lord had promised them. The spies came back with great panic and disbelief, and they described the people, a land full of giants that would crush the Israelites, the grasshoppers they were. And with the giants looming, the Israelites again fell short in their confidence of God and His promise. And at this point, they wanted to rebel against their faithful leader, moment, Moses. This is the deceitfulness of the hardened heart of sin. And there in that moment, the Lord finally rained down their judgment that none of them there would reach the promised land. See, that's a deceitfulness of sin, isn't it? It hardens the heart. It hardens the heart to God's word and his promises. And the Israelite story, we can look at them and say, how could they? But yet their story, humbly put, is our story. That in the midst of our own wilderness wandering, that we live in this moment, as we live in the now and wait for the not yet in our Lord's promise-filled return, how our confidence can easily be shaken by the flesh, the world, and the power of the devil. Because we know also the potpourri of panic, fear, disbelief, complacency, apathy, covetousness, and idolatry. That all there is left when it comes to our own self is, well, me, myself, and I. See, that's a deceitfulness of sin. It is not to trust in the true confidence, the full confidence, the delivering confidence of our Lord and His Word, but rather that tension that we face in our sin is that confidence in self to our own carnal security. For the Jewish Christians in the book of Hebrews, they too face the great temptation of trusting and confiding in their carnal flesh, in their own self-righteousness, in the abiding of the law. That was their confidence firm to the end. That was their great trust as they continue to see the tension in their flesh in this sin. And for you, friends, ask yourself, really, look in the mirror and ask yourself, what is my confidence? What am I sure of? What is my supreme trust? What is my assurance and certainty? Sure, when everything is in place, we tell ourselves, all is well. I need no one but myself. Yet when trials arise, just like the Israelites, where is your trust? Your human confidence, your, your independence, your self-dependence can only go so far in this carnal security that you hold dear to yourself. For in our sin, human confidence, no matter how much we put it on a pedestal, has no speak, has no play, has no power, because in our sin, there is no assurance or certainty, and thus no confidence in you and me. Just look at the gospel text. The man did all these things except one. He was confident. He thought he had all the pieces put into place for his way to be with God, yet he fell short because at the end of the day, it was the reality of sin and its deceit. When the devil attacks each and every one of us, 
He does it in the most dangerous way. He tries to shake your confidence. He tries to place your confidence in yourself, in your own self-righteousness, in your own works, in your own morality, in what you have done. He tries to shake your confidence by pointing you to self rather than to the one outside of yourself, Jesus Christ. See, that's the deceitfulness of sin. That we actually convince ourselves that we can inherit eternal life by our works. That we can answer for ourselves. That we can account and be our own advocate. And I know you all know that that's not true. But trust me, in our human flesh, we do it. That's how deceitful sin is. We know the truth of Christ alone, yet at the same time, how easily in our potpourri conscience that is filled with panic, fear, doubt, disbelief, and terror, where do we go? What do we trust? Where is our surety? For those who play basketball, sorry, this is a, one of the sports analogies throughout our sermon today. You step up to the free throw line when you have a career average of a 45% free throw average and when the championship is on the line and you have to make that one free throw to tie the ball game you are shaking in your shoes because you very well know that you have no confidence at all it reminds me of uh, Shaquille O'Neal when he was on the Lakers he could never make a free throw in that championship moment what was he going to do. You can't trust in yourself. There is nothing left. And so it is with us. Who are we kidding? That's right, Aaron. Who are we kidding in our sin that we can bring something to the table to appease God? There's no confidence in me or you. We could try to make it look beautiful. We can try to make it look perfect. We could try to show our own self-righteousness. But ever since the fall, there is no confidence in man. We see the Israelites in the wilderness. We see ourselves in our own wilderness wanderings. And thus we repent. See, we repent. We confess our sins. Not only do we confess our sins, but we know that our Lord is faithful and just. And in true confidence in this faith to the end, our Lord has and will always give you His promise. As He kept it, as He delivers it to you, the forgiveness of your sins. This is your original confidence to the end. It is Jesus who did not shake, but rather the one who is only faithful to the end, firm to the end. Jesus was there on the cross. Nothing could deter him, not the jeers, not the humiliation, not the pain, not the suffering, nothing at all. But Jesus, his work was for you. His blood shed on the cross, that was for you. His dying, the big death, that was for you. His sacrifice at Calvary, that was for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. And this is your confidence, that you are washed clean by the blood of Christ. That you are confident and stand firm in front of God, knowing full well that right now your name is written in the book of life, right now. Because it has already been proved by our Lord and Savior, who went to the cross to be your advocate. See, there is no digging deep for your confidence in front of God. There is no mustering up some type of piety to prove your worth and your confidence in front of God. No, your confidence, your trust, your faith is Jesus. Your confidence is Genesis 3.15. Your confidence is in the incarnation of Christ. Your confidence in the, is in the radiance of His glory. Your confidence is in His crucifixion. Your confidence is in His resurrection. Your confidence in this now and not yet and in the ascension is of His final return. Because surely... 
confidently he shall return for you. Jesus is your confidence. Jesus is your confidence. Firm to the end, you shall be. For the path has been paved by his very blood. Your place already prepared by his death, resurrection, and ascension. Your baptism robing you to the end in his righteousness. And to the end, firm you are in this confidence, knowing full well at this altar you are receiving the true body and blood for the forgiveness of your sins. This is your confidence, that your sins are atoned for and your peace is Christ's. Your conscience no longer potpourri and mixed up in this world, but rather your conscience covered by his blood, his sacrifice. Jesus is your confidence. And just as we sung in our sermon hymn, hymn 490, there we read in the last stanza, Jesus lives and now is death, but the gate of life immortal, this shall calm my trembling breath. When I pass its gloomy portal, faith shall cry as fails, fails each sense, Jesus is my confidence. That's right. No more trembling, no more wonder, no more terror, no more doubt. For you are forgiven. Jesus is my confidence. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.